All right. Thank you for uh, bearing with uh, me. Um, let's, uh, let's start by having a word of prayer and asking the Spirit to be with us this morning. Father, um, we humbly come before you this morning with open hearts, and we give you thanks for your love for us. And uh, as we've been prayed, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be here to fill this place and fill our hearts, draw us closer to you, Lord. May we see Jesus clearer this morning because we have been with you. And Father, you have a way of working things out, and so we trust in your providence, Lord, as we gather together here today. Someone needs to hear this message, and that's why I'm here this morning. And so I just pray, Father, for your continued spirit to dwell with us um, and bless us now today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I got a text at 6.30 this morning from our pastor, but I did not see his text till 7.30 as I was walking the dog. Um, and so um, our pastor's not feeling well. He's pretty sick, and sometimes these things happen. Um, so for some of you, you're going to be listening to a sermon that I preached back in December of last year, but I think it's appropriate today. But I'm kind of took a few liberties and just kind of shortened it and condensed it a little bit. Um, and I just have an impression that somehow the Lord worked it out because somebody here today needed to hear this message about a new start and a new beginning. And maybe it's appropriate that here we are in January, starting the year, and someone's looking for a fresh start. So um, with that, that's what we're going to be talking about. And we're going to be talking about it through the eyes of specifically, last time I talked, I compared Levi Matthew and the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus. And really, today I'm just going to talk about Levi Matthew. We're just going to talk about Levi Matthew and how God worked in his life um, to bring about change and to bring about a new beginning. And we're going to do this by asking four questions. We're going to ask four questions. The questions that we're going to ask is, what is the motivation? What does Jesus see? What is their response? What is his response? And what is the result of the interaction? So those are the four questions we're going to ask today as we look at Levi Matthew's life. Um, a lot of this is also taken from um, the desire of ages. Because when you read in the Gospels, you know, you can very quickly go through and kind of miss kind of what's happening here. Um, but I think we should probably, uh, I'll probably read it really quick so to familiarize ourselves with the story. And I invite you, if you have your Bible, to turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to be uh, reading 9 through 13. So just, you know, a few, a few verses. And it, this is kind of telling the story of Levi Matthew. And it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So that is it. The, interact, the whole interaction uh, in Matthew's account, uh, there's also one in Mark and Luke, uh, but in Matthew's account, it goes... Jesus comes up and he just says to Matthew, come follow me. And, and we might just read that today and it might not have the same significance or meaning that it would have had for somebody reading this or listening to this back in the first century. I don't know if any of you uh, paid much attention to the news, but uh, there was some news this week. I, I think our, our new uh, Congress, or they, they, were, they said about abolishing kind of our current taxes. How many of you, did you hear that about changing that? Um, you know, I, I thought that's, that's kind of interesting. How many of you like paying taxes? Yeah, I didn't think so. So, you know, I was like, well, but, you know, we know that's not going to happen, right? So we know that's not going to happen. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, definitely happens, and it's something that's for sure is paying your taxes. Now, it's one thing to pay taxes for a country that we love, Right? But what happens if you have to pay taxes for an occupying power? How, does, how would that make you feel? 
even worse, right? Um, the tax rates during the Roman Empire, you know, were really high. I mean, some accounts up to almost 80 or 90 percent. So, you know, there would be a lot of grievances, right? You would, re you would resent them very much. And so this is kind of the context that I just want to kind of, you know, share with you this morning as we look at what it meant for Jesus. He already had called, I think, three disciples. This would have been the fourth disciple. But he had already called some disciples, or actually Matthew might have been the fifth. Um, so, you know, to call a tax collector in, in the first century would have been something that would have been shocking. To us, it might not seem that same way, but in that time, it was very shocking because tax collectors were viewed as traitors, traitors to your own country. How could they work for the Romans, right? How could they work for the occupying power? You know, if you mentioned tax collectors, it would be like, pfft, you would spit at a tax collector. You would not want to have anything to do with them. You would not associate with them. You would stay as far away from them. Tax collectors obviously had to be compensated pretty well to do this because who would want that job? Who would want the job that would ostracize you from your community, that nobody would want to have anything to do with you? That's Matthew's life. I want you to kind of just picture what that must have been like for Matthew and even to think about what were the circumstances that led Matthew to be even want to be a tax collector, to be ostracized from his people, you know, what was going on behind the scenes that would have caused Matthew to do this? But the fact is that Matthew, was, his chosen profession was a tax collector. He might have been good with math, but tax collectors had an awful reputation. Nobody liked tax collectors, and you would stay away from them. Especially if you're a religious leader, you would talk bad about the tax collectors. You would not want anything to do with them. You would not even talk to them. You would not engage in any kind of conversation you would just ignore them. And that was taught to the people. So the religious leaders had a strong influence on the people, and so they influenced them. And so we can look at and think that Matthew was probably, other than his family, his close family, and other tax collectors, he was pretty much shunned by the rest of them. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with him. How would that make you feel to be in that kind of position where nobody wanted to have anything to do with you in your community, that people would just kind of pretend like you're not there or to walk, you know, by and, and, and ignore you? So um, that was kind of the context of, of Matthew. Um, so these were the uh, questions that we were going to ask. Matthew the tax collector, and we read that Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's group, and he said to him, follow me. And so Matthew got up and followed him. Um, we might, we read this and we say, wow, he just got up and just followed him. Obviously, Matthew had had some interaction with Jesus before. He had heard about Jesus, and I can picture perhaps Matthew going and standing afar as listening to Jesus uh, but probably maybe hiding behind a tree or just kind of standing off to the side where nobody uh, was and to just listen, to take in some of Jesus' teachings. And we know that this probably happened because he was touched by it. He, he heard something in Jesus' message, in Jesus reaching out uh, to him. Here's a quote from Desire of Ages, which I will be uh, using uh, a lot. And it says, The Pharisees had judged Matthew according to his employment meaning because he was a tax collector, they had already judged him. That's all you needed to know. If I know that you were a tax collector, I knew everything I needed to know about you. I knew that you were a traitor. I knew that, you know, I didn't want to have anything to do with you. I knew that you were, you know, uh, unscrupulous. You know, I knew everything I needed to know. And that's the way the Pharisees judged Matthew, according to his employment. But Jesus saw. Jesus sees things that are different than we do. And I'm so glad because of that. Jesus saw this man a heart, and I underline that, it says that a heart that was open for the reception of truth. Matthew had listened to the Savior's teaching. As the convicting Spirit of God revealed his sinfulness, he longed to seek help from Christ. But he was accustomed 
to the exclusiveness of the rabbis and had no thought that the great teacher would notice him. He didn't think that, the, that Jesus would notice him at all. He thought that, you know, he, this is this young rabbi that, you know, has a lot of attention and um, everybody is, you know, seeking him and, and wants to, you know, be with Jesus. Surely Jesus is not going to want to even be with me. Jesus is not going to want to talk to me. So that was the mindset that, uh, that Matthew had. Uh, and notice the, the, the mindset that the Pharisees had. The Pharisees said, you're a tax collector. You are not worthy of our time. We would just ignore you. We don't, have, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Jewish, cu- Jewish culture in the first century was very stratified. Um, and in those days, there was this notion and idea of social contamination, meaning that just by me associating with you, I would be contaminated. I would be sinful. So if you were a sinful person or considered to be a sinful person or somebody of doubtful reputation, and if I associated myself with you, that means that I was kind of aligning myself with you and therefore their sins and their, you know, dirtiness was kind of cling to me. That's the way they they viewed it. They had this notion. Now, to us, this is a very foreign idea. To us, you know, that's something that it's hard for us to relate to. But back then, in this experience that Matthew had, this idea of social contamination was very prevalent, very strong. And so nobody wanted to associate with it. You know, nobody wanted to be disfellowshipped uh, from associating uh, with a tax collector. And so these individuals whether it was a a Samaritan or a Gentile, but worse, a tax collector or sinners, those were deemed unclean. People didn't want to have anything to do with them. So here it says, from Desire of Ages, page 273.2 says, Matthew left all, rose up and followed him. There was no hesitation, no questioning, no thought of the lucrative business to be exchanged for poverty and hardship. It was enough for him that he was to be with Jesus and that he might listen to his words and unite with him in his work. That was all that Matthew's motivation. That's that's what Matthew is thinking. Matthew is thinking, you know what? I I'll just I'll just I'll follow him. You know, he's just going to go and in and, and in my mind's eye, you know, I could picture, you know, Jesus coming down, walking down the street. Matthew's at his tax collector's booth. Regular day, people coming in and going. And here comes Jesus, and he knows and he recognizes him that that's Jesus. And in his heart, he says, wow, I wish I could spend some time with him to tell him I want that forgiveness, that I long for that. But the reality was like, well, hey, I'm a tax collector, right? So... Jesus is not going to talk to me. Jesus is going to ignore me, just like all the other rabbis, because that's what he was used to. It says here that he was accustomed to it. He was accustomed to being ignored. He was accustomed to, you know, not uh, having any attention uh, paid to him. So Jesus being a religious leader, the expectation, um, you know, was that, you know, just like everyone else, Jesus would probably just walk on by and ignore him. That was his expectation. But like so many times with Jesus, he defies our human convention and prejudices. He demonstrates how his kingdom operates under a different set of rules and norms for those, you know, that the world operates in. So many examples of those who encountered Jesus were immediately exposed bare by his questioning and his interactions. You know, the Bible writer assumes that we will understand context and culture and time as we read this account. But Matthew's expectation, you know, everything that Matthew knew was that Jesus would just kind of walk on by. Can you imagine the surprise as he sees Jesus coming down this cobble street road, narrow, with all, you know, some of the disciples, maybe other people following him. And for him to stop by his booth and to address him and talk to him, for Matthew, was that was not expected. It was not expected. And he says to him, Follow me. Immediately, he gets up without questioning, 
and follows Jesus. He follows the great teacher. That was something that when we read that, that notion of follow me, it's an invitation to acceptance and a fresh start. That's what Matthew heard. Matthew heard acceptance and a fresh start. That was something that God was offering him when he said, follow me. That invitation to follow Jesus was an invitation for a fresh start. No longer would he be consigned and, and, and set aside and ignored he would have the opportunity to sit at Jesus' feet, to listen to him, and to participate and work with him side by side. That was a new start. That was a new beginning. How many of us today have the same opportunity, the same message that is being called to us who says, follow me? Jesus has that same invitation for each one of us when he says, follow me. And whenever we hear that word to follow him, It is an invitation of acceptance and a new start. And maybe that's something that we, as we start the new year, something that maybe we need to be reminded of. That as the children's story is like, you know, we can carry around our baggage with us or we can just kind of lay it it at Jesus' feet and let him take care of things. Um, You know, we were discussing in our Sabbath school class this morning about trust and um, that that was kind of part of, the, part, of the, part of our challenge that we have in terms of being faithful to God in the covenant relationship is that, you know, it's a two-way street. He promises to do certain things, and he expects us to keep our side of the promise, to be faithful and to trust him. And um, if any of you uh, weren't here for, for Sabbath school, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a great discussion, and I invite you and encourage you to Come to Sabbath school and participate and just kind of sit in and, and just share. There's just so much that we grow and we learn. Um, and, and, it's, and it's something that uh, um, you will be richly blessed by doing it because God offers us rich blessings if we would just take the time to spend time with him. When Jesus looked at Matthew, he saw a heart that was open. A heart that was willing to listen and to take things in. An open heart is like a, you could look like like a vessel, right? It's empty. And because it's empty, it could receive things. Sometimes vessels are empty because they are cracked or they are broken. There is room in the heart for reception of truth. By contrast, a closed heart might be one that is full and there's no room for any truth. It is full and closed off. It is self-sufficient and exclusive. The Pharisees were of this class. They had no need for Jesus' teaching. They, you know, they thought they knew everything. We, you know, we, we, you know, they were the leaders. They knew best. And so they, you know, they did have no room for Jesus. But by contrast, here Matthew, the tax collector, had an open heart. And there was room in there to receive the teaching that Jesus would have. And I think that's an important lesson for us to maybe consider and to think that sometimes maybe when we go through trials and hardships and we're broken and we've suffered things, you know, there's openings in our heart. There's cracks there that there's room for Jesus to fill those in. And I think Jesus wants to fill us with him. He wants to fill fill us with his goodness. He wants to fill us with those things. So whenever we have those experiences that leave us feeling empty, Jesus wants to fill us. Jesus wants to be the one that takes us and um, becomes the center of our lives and fills us and closes up uh, those empty spots in our hearts or heals kind of our brokenheartedness. Jesus' invitation to Matthew was amazing. Jesus inviting a tax collector to be one of his disciples. Jesus knew that this, he knew how this would be received. You know, the Pharisees were already plotting how to get rid of Jesus. They were plotting how to kill him. They were plotting how to do this. So when Jesus calls, because Jesus was becoming very popular with the people, and so they were jealous right? Jesus becoming so popular and everybody attending to him. And so when Jesus then says and invites 
Matthew, Levi Matthew to be one of his disciples, they're saying, hey, we got him. What a, what a fool. He invited a tax collector to be one of his disciples. You know, that's a blunder. You know, did he check with his PR people? Didn't they not tell him that that would be a bad mistake? The, the, the rest of the people were going to be like, what is he doing? He's bringing on a traitor to our country, a traitor to our people, a traitor to our national identity. What kind of rabbi is this? What took place in the invitation of Levi Matthew, the writers, when they wrote it, it was supposed to shock us. We're supposed to feel shocked that Jesus would do this, that he would invite it. And Jesus knew the reaction that they would have. And he knew that they were going to, uh, you know, say these things about him. They would see that they were going to pin that against the people. So he knew that that was going to take place. They didn't catch him by surprise, but the fact that Jesus did it anyway, that Jesus didn't care because he saw a life that was willing to follow him. Jesus did not, you know, hesitate in any way, but, you know, continued with that invitation. There was no hesitation on Matthew's part. So we read that Matthew left and rose up and he left all. Matthew didn't think twice. He instinctively followed Jesus, leaves everything behind. He does not seeking fame or fortune or power. And all it says is that he wanted to be with Jesus. He didn't consider what he was going to lose, but really what he was going to gain. And sometimes maybe in life we we do that to ourselves. We, some people, especially young people, sometimes we think, oh, following Jesus, you know, or, or going to church is so hard. Or you think that you're going to lose out on life. The reality is you're going to gain life. You're going to ha- have a more abundant, rich life when we have Jesus. This is kind of one of the lies that, that Satan, ta- you know, tells us. That somehow we have to give up being joyful. Or somehow we ha- we're going to lose something by following Jesus. That is such a lie. We should not believe it. By following Jesus, you will get a better life. You'll have a better life, a more rich and abundant life. Isn't that what Jesus said? He came to give us a more abundant life. And isn't that what we would want? We want that for our kids. We want it for ourselves. We want a more abundant life. And Jesus offers that. And he offered that to Matthew. He offered something new to Matthew. Matthew got acceptance and a fresh start to be in the inner circle with Jesus. Jesus rewrote Matthew's story. Jesus changed everything for Matthew. That invitation changed everything. And Jesus' invitation for you and me to follow him this year, to follow him closer, it changes everything for us. It has the potential to rewrite our story for this coming year. We can hope for something better because Jesus is willing to rewrite our story. The calling of uh, Levi Matthew here. It says, The calling of Matthew to be one of Christ's disciples excited great indignation. For a religious teacher to choose a publican as one of his immediate attendants was an offense against the religious, social, and national customs. And by appealing to the prejudices of the people, the Pharisees hoped to turn the current of popular feeling against Jesus. That's what they wanted. But while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Could you imagine the picture that we get of Jesus here? Jesus was invited to the tax collector to have a party. There was this, this, Matthew was overjoyed that Jesus had invited him to be one of his disciples, to follow him. And so Matthew, you know, and Matthew was well off. He, he was, you know, he, I'm sure he lived in a very nice home. He had servants. And so Matthew says, I'm going to throw a party. 
I'm going to throw a party for Jesus, and I'm going to invite all my friends. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. So other tax collectors, um, others maybe of doubtful reputation, uh, those that would associate with a tax collector, because who would associate with a tax collector back then, right? So what, what kind of people came to this party? And the fact, think of it, that Jesus is okay, and he accepts the invitation to go to this party that Matthew uh, decides to throw for him. I think that's pretty revealing. Matthew was excited, and he was excited because he wanted to share with those he knew the joy that he felt. He wanted to share with them the joy of his new discipleship. Here it is from, uh, 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 from, page, uh, from Desire of Ages. Among the publicans, a widespread interest was created. Their hearts were drawn toward the divine teacher. In the joy of his new discipleship, Matthew longed to bring his former associates to Jesus. Isn't that always the case sometimes? Do you remember when you first learned about Jesus and what he did for you? And the joy that you had, that fire, and you wanted to share that with others? God is so good. And he wanted to share it with his associates. Can you blame him? He wanted to share that. So accordingly, he made a feast at his own house and called together his relatives and friends. Not only were publicans included, but many others who were of doubtful reputation and were prescribed by their more, um, prescribed by their more scrupulous neighbors, meaning you know, they were looked down upon. Of course, the, this news would have spread like wildfire. Did you hear that Jesus invited a tax collector to be one of his disciples? Can you imagine that? And if you were a tax collector, if you were a tax collector, can you imagine that word that spread from them? Or if you were somebody of doubtful reputation, could you imagine how the word got spread that, hey, Jesus invited a tax collector to be with him. Do you think that he would then be open to me, right? Isn't that what would run through your mind? It's like, hey, if Jesus is willing to accept a tax collector, maybe there's hope for me too. Right? That, that is kind of the implication that, um, that, that Jesus was, was, was handing out by that invitation to him. What kind of rabbi is this? He hangs around and goes to parties with sinners and tax collectors. So when the Pharisees, Matthew chapter 9, verse 11 says, When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees knew exactly what they were doing. They didn't go to Jesus. They went to his disciples because they wanted to, you know, create division. Because they knew that, hey, why is, you know, why, is your, why is your teacher, man, he's really blowing it here. He's eating with a tax collector and eating with sinners. That idea of social contamination, right? They were trying to pin this, Jesus' disciples um, against him and, and cause doubt in their minds. You know, and, and I can just, you know, picture maybe Jesus at this, um, at this party. So there's tax collectors, there's people of doubtful reputation, there are sinners there, and Jesus is okay to be there. He, you know, he, he, he accepts the invitation and he's sitting there and they're passing the food. They're having this great feast. They have the servants. They're eating, you know, pass, pass the hummus, the baba ganoush. They're, they're, they're exchanging things. And Jesus is hanging out with these guys. And they're just blown away that a rabbi would, would hang out with them and talk with them. And Jesus, I'm sure, is sharing things with them and just enjoying the company. And I can just maybe picture Matthew just kind of wondering, Looking back, like, wow, could he have thought of that that was going to happen like a day before or two days before? Do you think that that would have come into his mind, that, that reality that here was Jesus and his friends and his family and sinners, and Jesus is hanging out with them, talking to them? What does that say about the type of God that we have, that he's, he's willing to come down and meet us wherever we are? In whatever conditions we are, he's there. He's willing to come and, and engage with us and eat with us. You know, eating is a very intimate thing to, to, to eat with somebody, to have fellowship. 
you know, it's a very intimate, you know, connection. You, you, you bond with people. And here Jesus is bonding with people, people that the Pharisees and the people that time would want to like stay away from and not have anything to do with. And I'm wondering whether, do we have prejudices in our own mind today? Are we, do we, are there any of those things that, you know, that like the Pharisees, any ideas that we have about those who we would be willing to associate with and those who we would not be willing to associate with? Are there people in our society that we would much rather stay away from? Are we any different than the Pharisees from that standpoint? It's safe to kind of hang out with people that we know. It's safe to kind of be with people that think like us, look like us, you know, hang out, you know, that believe the same things. But yet in this example, it, I think it, there's a challenge for us. In this story of Levi Matthew, there's a challenge to us about preconceived ideas about who we can hang out with and who we can't hang out with. But, but for the purpose of, you know, reaching them, right? For the, for the purpose of, of, of leading them to get to know Jesus. There, 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 we, shouldn't, we shouldn't try to avoid people. We should try to make connections. We shouldn't try to, you know, create walls and build walls that separate us from one another or separate us from others. We should try to build bridges and things that we have in common so that we can reach them and tell them about the good news of Jesus, of what he's done for us, of how he has blessed us, right? Those are opportunities that we have. And, and I think, you know, as I was reading this story again, you know, I had to remind myself that, you know, are there people that I, you know, would not want to hang out with? Or if I got invited to a, a party, you know, to, you know, to, hey, we want you to come, would I attend or would I not attend? You know, that, that it, it, this, this story raises these, these questions. But what an amazing picture of God that this presents. It's that God is the friend of sinners. God is the friend of sinners. And if God is the friend of sinners and I am the son of God, if we are his children, by implication, shouldn't we also be friends to sinners? Right? So Matthew 9, 12, 13 says, But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You know, in the Pharisee mind, um, in, 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 in their mind, they could not understand and they could not comprehend their picture of God was so twisted that they could not understand that God would be willing to eat and commune with sinners. They, 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 they could not. So when they came to Jesus and when they came in other places and asked him, why? Because that was really the main argument for Jesus. They said, he eats with sinners. You know, how, how does he do this? They, they couldn't comprehend that, that God had an open heart to, to those around him. They could not understand. Your teacher eats with tax collectors and sinners. This was the major critique of Jesus by the religious establishment. They could not conceive of a God who would not, was not a respecter of persons, who was indifferent to your social class, whether you were rich or whether you were poor. Like God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Notice that the Pharisees didn't ask Jesus, but they asked his disciples to sow division. And, you know, you have to appreciate Jesus' boldness, right? Jesus is very bold with, with them and tells the religious leaders, go back and read your texts. Go, go back and, and read and understand what this means. So Jesus quoted from Hosea. And so when he quoted from Hosea, he quoted the first part, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He says, go understand what this means. The second part or that part of that verse is, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God wants us to get to know him, to know God, to know what he's like, right? So he desires that more than sacrifice and mercy. To be able to show mercy to others is part of what we are called to do and to know God because that's the way we're reflecting God. 
The Pharisees, by contrast, they thought themselves too wise. They thought that they were too full of themselves, too important. But as Jesus sat as the honored guest at the table of the publicans, by his sympathy and social kindness, showing that he recognized the dignity of humanity, and men longed to become worthy of his confidence. Upon their thirsty hearts, his words fell with blessed, life-giving power. New impulses were awakened, and the possibility of a new life opened to these outcasts of society. Right there at that meal, the hope sprung because Jesus was willing to be there with them, and they have a new hope of a possibility of a better and a different life. And that is what Jesus offers us today as well. He offers us that a new beginning and a new life. And so for those that were sitting around with Jesus, eating, exchanging food, these were people that were not used to being in front of a rabbi because the rabbis would ignore them. So here Jesus takes that opportunity to minister to them, to open to them new possibilities to those that society thought unworthy of it. So the Pharisees thought themselves too wise to need instruction, too righteous to need salvation, too highly honored to need the honor that comes from Christ. The Savior turned away from them to find others who would receive the message from heaven in the untutored fishermen, in the publicans, at the marketplace, in the women of Samaria, in the common people who heard him gladly. He found his new bottles for the new wine. I'm so glad that Jesus, by his example, went out and reached out to those who were of doubtful reputation. The, the Pharisees were full. They didn't have need of Jesus. Thank you very much, but we're full. There's no room for you, Jesus. But Jesus did not hesitate to accept that invitation. He did not discriminate, but he shared the gospel to all. Jesus sat as the honored guest. And, you know, that must have been a beautiful sight. The religious leaders were too full, but the tax collectors and the sinners were open. They were empty, ready to receive Jesus' call in their life. So, what, is, what was Matthew's motivation? We had four questions at the beginning. What was Matthew's motivation for seeking Jesus? He just wanted to be with Jesus to listen to his words and join in his labor. That's all he wanted to do. What did Jesus see when he saw Matthew? Jesus saw an open heart. And then what was Matthew's response? He got up and followed Jesus. He didn't question what he was going to lose. He just got up and he followed him. So what was the result of that interaction that Matthew had with with Jesus, Matthew became a disciple of Jesus, and he led others, and he wrote the book of Matthew, the gospel according to the book of Matthew. For us this morning, today, as I kind of wrap up, there's a, there's a quote from Ty Gibson uh, that I read the other day, not too long ago, and it says, when Jesus came into the world, he was overwhelmingly attracted to the disowned disliked and disenfranchised. The poor, the sick, the immoral, the used, the depressed, the hurting, the jacked up and the knocked down, that's me. So I know that Jesus is attracted to me. This morning, you can have the assurance that whatever your background is, Jesus is attracted to you and he wants to spend time with you. And his invitation for you is to follow him. And perhaps this morning, you have one thing, you know, uh, that there is something in your life, like, you know, Matthew, um, those who are of doubtful reputation or you consider yourself, or, or the invitation to follow him is an offer this morning for everyone here and for the whole humanity to, to a new start. Even religious people need a fresh start, especially religious people, you could argue. They, they're the ones that need the, a fresh start the most. They might think themselves to be too full Jesus is our reward. Jesus' invitation to you is, I know that you're broken. I know that you're cracked. I know that you're empty. And you're just the kind of people that I'm looking for. 
Jesus is looking to people that are empty, that are broken, that he can fill. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel broken. And that's the time when I feel that I have the need for Jesus. I need him to fill me. And this morning, the invitation for you is that Jesus wants to fill you. Uh, this is from Desire of Ages, page 113, to close. It says, And the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, embraces humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative. With all our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless. Jesus, when God spoke that, he speaks that to us. Here is my beloved son. Here is my beloved daughter, who, in whom I am well pleased. And that invitation is for you and for me. So in closing, I'd like you to turn to your right, to the person next to you, and tell them, you are not cast aside and you are not worthless. Now turn to the person on, the, on your other side and I will tell you that this will probably be a little bit harder. This will be a little bit harder. Say, I am not set aside or worthless. Jesus' invitation to us this morning is to follow him, just like the invitation to Matthew. Follow me, where as we start our new year, we can hear the words acceptance and a fresh start. Jesus offers us this morning, everyone here, acceptance and a fresh start. We have, um, we have potluck, so... Um, I want you, invite you all to stay. So let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we are grateful that the example that you gave through Jesus was one that you sought out sinners and you were happy to engage with them in conversation, to eat with them, to hang out with them, to get to know them. And Father, here we are. We are sinners as well. And we are so grateful that you are willing to invite us to follow you. And that that invitation to follow you, that invitation that you have for us, Lord, we want to say yes today. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to fulfill our responsibilities of the covenant as we studied this morning, that you would help us, Lord, to be faithful to you in all things, that we would return to you not only a fair tithe and offering, but that we would do it with a joyful heart, that every aspect of our lives, whether it's business, or work, or family, that we would trust you, and that we would put everything into your hands. And Lord, we are just grateful that you are willing to walk with us uh, through each and every day. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen.